Good morning and welcome to worship here at the Village Church at the Advent Christian Village in Dowling Park, Florida. We're thankful that you have chosen to share this time with us. It's our desire to lead you in worship this morning as we lift up our Lord in in word and in song and in prayer. As we begin, uh, for those of you who uh, may be able to see it, I wanted to take note that our sanctuary is adorned with a beautiful flower arrangement today that has been given in memory of Evelyn Wallace. And a number of us gathered yesterday for a memorial service in, in her honor, and it was a beautiful, beautiful service. I'd like to make some announcements to bring those to your attention. Uh, Again, we're thankful for those of you who are worshiping with us, whether it's on TV2 or Facebook or YouTube, and we hope that you'll continue to do so. Following this service at 1130, Bruce Strickland's Sunday School class will be meeting in Bixler Chapel. On Tuesday at 8.30, the men's Bible study will also be meeting there in Bixler Chapel under the leadership of Michael Saunders. On Wednesday, the Village Church Bible Institute will meet at 10 a.m. And on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we'll be meeting for our midweek prayer and devotional service here in the sanctuary led by Brother Don Wrigley. There is a correction from something that is posted in your worship guide. The Friday Bible study that normally meets will not be meeting this week, but it will resume the following week. And uh, Michael Saunders can fill those of you in who participate in that gathering. Coming up this, this coming Saturday on the 26th, uh, we will be joining in a, in a time of prayer for our nation. There is a prayer march that is taking place in Washington, D.C. that will begin at noon and continue through 2 p.m. Now, most of us won't be able to be in Washington, D.C., and so we are providing an opportunity It's really a a, a drop-in opportunity for those of you who would like to come and pray together regarding our nation and its needs and a a prayer that God would revive and restore us as a people. And so there's information regarding that in the worship guide, and there will be more that will be coming out. But again, that's this coming Saturday at noon and it will last until 2 p.m. You may not be able to attend all of that, but if you can drop in and share in that, we'd be glad to have you do that. There is also a link uh, posted in the worship guide that will, will help you to participate in that at your home or wherever you happen to be. Now, I'm glad to be able to announce this morning that we are about to begin regathering for Sunday morning worship here at the Village Church. That's going to happen in phases, and it's not going to look like what we were experiencing uh, prior to March, but we're making a good step in, in the right direction. Initially, we're going to be limiting our gathering to 75 persons in our congregation, And it will be necessary for you, if you would like to participate, to call in and make a reservation. We'll be alternating Sundays. And our our intent is, again, initially to allow everyone who would like to regather, who feels comfortable in doing that, to be able to share in a service in person uh, at least once a month. We are designating the second Sunday of each month during this phase-in process exclusively for those who are non-ACV members who have not been able to come onto the campus uh, previously. And those services on the second Sunday, again, will be exclusively for you. And we will be sharing in 
pretty much a traditional worship service. We will, however, be wearing masks. We will be practicing social distancing, and that is why we have to limit our numbers. And uh, we hope, we hope that you will want to come and share with us in this. There will be more information coming out. That will begin on October the 4th. That's two Sundays from now. And so more information will be forthcoming between now and then. Well, we have come together today to enter into an experience of worship. And so I'd like to lead us in an invocation. Would you pray with me? Father, we pause to recognize you. You are the eternal God. You are the God who has been our dwelling place throughout all generations. We would worship you today. We pray, our Father, that as you look at our hearts and you can see our hearts, you know our intention, we pray that as you look into our hearts, you will see our love for you and our desire to love you more, our desire, O oh Father, to honor you and to bless your heart and to lift you up this day. So to that end, we offer ourselves to you and we pray that Jesus Christ may be lifted high. And now, Father, speak to us even as we speak to you in our praying and our singing and the, the very thoughts of our minds. To this end, we offer our prayer in our Savior's name. Amen. Let us continue as we sing of our everlasting God.
What an honor it is to read God's Word. What an honor it is to hear God's Word. Looking at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it cost all you have. Get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. May God's blessing abide with the reading and the hearing of His Word. This morning we're going to con begin our time of prayer with a song, Be Thou My Vision. So let us begin in song. <laughs>
As we come to this time of prayer as a people, I'd like to remind you of the words of Proverbs 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and good and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Let's join our hearts together this morning in prayer. Lord, this morning we know that it is good to be joined even as we are together as a congregation to worship and adore you. Lord, you have given us that right, that privilege through your Son, whose sacrifice on the cross forgave us for our sins, and through whom we come and petition, and he petitions for us. Lord, at the name of Christ, we find forgiveness, faith, hope, and meaning. Lord, this morning we think of those who are in our community who are struggling for one reason or another, who have come from doctor's appointments, who are hurting, who are contemplating how they'll go through the day with the aches and pains that they feel. Lord, but I, I know that there are those in our congregation that have family members that receive uh, disheartening news and are thinking of them and praying for them. But we know that there are those who are saddened by the death of those in our community. Shirley Hunter and Ron Strombeck, Carolyn Wiggins, Carolyn Wiggins and Evelyn Wallace. Well, we know that there are those who are mourning the deaths of others across this nation. Some that many people know, some that very few know. But Lord, each life is precious and important to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are mourning and give them comfort and give them peace. Lord, this morning we're excited that we get to worship you. And Lord, we're excited that soon we'll be able to worship together with some of those in our community as we build towards uh, more normalcy. And gathering together. Lord, help us not to forget that our world is not normal. That it is strangely odd at times. Separated and disjointed. Confused and angry. Hurt and bitter at times. Lord, we have an awesome, amazing privilege that through you we can be agents of unity, binding together those, shining light on you who bring love and hope and prosperity, those who need encouragement can seek that from you, that Lord, no matter who we are or what we look like, what our background is or where we come from. 
You love us all the same as individuals. You died for each and every person so that they may have forgiveness of sin and have eternal life. Lord, we're more alike than we are different. I pray, Lord, that we would, when we have opportunity to be more alike and to spread love and cheer and unity to those that we meet in our community, those in our group of friends, those that we come across in passing through the hallways and in the stores and outside as we walk. Lord, may we be encouraged to pray for the unity of our country. Lord, we're only strong when we're together. And right now, Lord, it feels as though we are disjointed, pulled apart, and forced to choose sides. And Lord, I pray that you would bring upon this nation the healing that's needed to mend those fences, to help others hear what's being said, what's being shared, the anger, the frustration, and allow those who have the authority to make rules and laws that would help ease the suffering for those who are suffering to bind us together as a country, to help us again to be that melting pot of many people from different places that come together for the good of one another. Lord, this morning we contemplate all that there is I mean, Lord, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for all things. We don't understand it. We don't fully see it. We don't fully realize what's going on around us. But Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to remember your words, to cherish them, to write them on the tablet of our heart, that we would carry them with us, that wherever we would go, that you would be with us, and that we would be with you. Most of all, Lord, we cannot wait for the time of your the time of your return. Lord, sometimes it feels like it surely has to be soon. And if it is soon, Lord, then let us as a church be about your work, proclaiming your message of salvation. Lord, that those who do not know who you are will be moved by the Spirit to accept you. That those of us who do know who you are would boldly share our faith with those around us Encourage those who already believe and bind our hearts together with one another as people who follow Christ to make a difference in our world, to make a difference in our community, in our homes, in our relationships, our friendships. Lord, may you be exalted in all things. For it is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Join us as we sing, O oh God, our help in ages past. <laughs>
I am so glad to be a part of the Village Church, to be a part of a church that is filled with not only talent, but talent that is dedicated, dedicated to God. Over these months that we have worshipped without a congregation, it has reminded me that our object of worship is God. Worship is not a performance. Worship is raising up the name of our Lord and hearing Him. We hear Him through music. We hear Him through prayers. We hear Him through the reading of His Word. The passage of Scripture that we're going to now is Psalm 90. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, 
From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And thus reads God's word. Thank you, Pastor Frank, for reading the word to us today, and Randy as well, earlier in the service. Ladies, thank you for beautiful song that communicated the, the truth of God's word to us. I appreciate those of you who volunteer your time to make it possible for us to bring our service into the homes of others. And uh, your faithfulness is very, very much appreciated in whatever role that you've uh, been playing in during this time. And Brother Frank read for us this morning the 90th Psalm. It is a prayer. It is a prayer that the man of God, Moses, offered to the Lord. It is a prayer that provides for us great insight into the heart of Moses and provides for us great wisdom for consideration in our own lives. Moses was a man who, at age 80, received a call from God to take on a task that was going to be a 40-year project. Imagine that. At age 80, God says, Moses, I've got something for you to do. Pack a bag, because it's going to take a while, Moses, to, for you to accomplish what I want you to accomplish. The psalm begins with these words, and you've heard these words this morning repeated through a variety of songs, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Boy, those are words of assurance. Moses, speaking from his heart, expresses his great confidence in God and, and provides for us 
a, a prayer of wisdom, a path of wisdom, if you will, in how it is that we might live what I have termed as a message title, the good life. And you'll find quickly that, uh, as I understand the good life, it's in, in stark distinction from how it's often defined in our living today. But Moses expresses from his heart that God is his security in the midst of a constantly changing world and a constantly changing life. And the wisdom for us is that we too should allow God to be our security as life brings its changes. Can you imagine, I don't know when the last time you thought about all the changes that Moses experienced during his life. Tremendous changes. As he, in many ways, began life as a pampered prince. That wasn't the beginning, but... uh, That would have been his first memories. He went from being a pampered prince to a rugged shepherd. Then he became a reluctant and also a very highly criticized leader for a group of former slaves who were not at all happy that things had gone in the direction that they had gone. As Moses looked back on his constantly changing life, He saw one constant, one sure thing, one solid foundation that sustained him through all the changes that he faced over the course of his life. He said, Lord, you've been our dwelling place. You've been home. There's something about home that is comforting. You know, I... uh, since I responded to the call of God for my life to serve the Lord in, in ministry, I've lived in a number of different places. And yet when I think about home, I look back to where I, I began. And there's some comfort in that, though I've, especially in recent years, rarely been there. But there's something comforting about what home represents Lord, through all the generations, Moses says, you've been our home. God was there when Moses was placed in a basket and laid in the Nile, along the banks of the Nile. God was there when he was raised in a pagan palace. God was there when Moses' temper got the best of him and he took another man's life. God was there as he escaped into the wilderness and into Midian and became a shepherd. God was there appearing to Moses in a burning bush and extending a call upon his life. God was there later as Moses would stand before Pharaoh and perform miracles. God was there as Moses led the Israelites in the Exodus, as they were pinned between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, God was there. And in the wilderness, as Moses tried to lead those stubborn people, God was there guiding them with a pillar of fire and a cloud. And so Moses declares from everlasting to everlasting You're God. No matter what else changes, you're God. I like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases that in the message. He says, from once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. God is the eternal God. No matter what else changes. If you're listening to my voice this morning, And you're, oh, age 50 or older, you're 50, 60, 70s, and and so forth, you've gone through a lot of changes in your life as well. Let me mention several of them that came to mind. Technology changes. My goodness. Some of you uh, 
take to technology and electronics like you were born with it in your hand. Those of us who've been around a little longer have seen some marked changes in technology, whether it be home computers, internet, smartphones, iPads, and more. Yeah, I'm the first one to confess that my smartphone that I carry in my pocket is smarter than I am. And uh, for years, my daughters would bail me out. Now Randy bails me out when I don't know what else to do. Changing technology has been a, a great tool. As a matter of fact, if you're listening to my voice this morning, and, you're, and not many of you are sitting in this place, it's a result of how technology has changed. Isn't it amazing? that so many local pastors now can have a ministry far beyond even their own community. We have people who follow our service all over the country, and, and we are grateful for that. But technology has changed, and that's, that's a good thing, used in the right way. Some changes have not been good that we've seen. Moral values of our country have changed drastically. What just a, a couple of decades ago was widely considered as reprehensible now is just openly embraced and promoted and accepted. And unfortunately, even in many churches. Political correctness seems to have trumped common sense in our nation. We hardly recognize our country anymore. The news astounds us as we look at it. And it's unsettling. As we age, our minds aren't as reliable as they once were. We're more forgetful. Where did I put my keys? Where did I park the car in, in the Walmart parking lot? You know, it, did I turn the stove off? Uh, I... Uh, for years followed the ministry of uh, Pastor Bob Russell out in Louisville, Kentucky. And I remember a story that he told where uh, he, he was so excited to go golfing one day that he got out, unloaded his clubs off, off of his car, out of his, the trunk of his car, put them on the golf cart, and went out and played a long round of golf and had lunch, and he came back about seven hours later, and his car was still idling in the parking lot. Uh, we forget things. I'm, I'm capable of doing that sort of thing. We've seen changes in the church, and some of those, I think, are good changes. We're incorporating more instruments in our worship. We, we've gotten beyond the idea that only certain instruments are sacred instruments. And, and now we, we can use many talents and many different sounds to lift up our worship to the Lord. We've added new songs. We make use of words being projected upon to a screen or upon to a monitor. That I, that I think is a help because we don't bury our faces in a songbook. We make use of technology today in the church to be able to, to read the scriptures. For some, that means that in, in, instead of carrying a, a leather-bound Bible, they might be reading the scripture from their iPad or their smartphone. I was in a worship service where a mother looked over and she saw her adult daughter who had children looking at her smartphone during the service and just berated her immediately following the service only to find out that what her daughter was doing was following along in the scriptures on her phone. And the lady who did it told me about it and just laughed at herself. We've seen changes. And changes can be disconcerting and unsettling. But Moses reminds us that at every turn, no matter what changes take place, that the sovereign God, the sovereign Lord of this universe is there. He is our dwelling place. And so the wisdom for us 
is to make God our security, our constant. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. In, all the un- in the midst of all the unsettling changes that take place over the course of our lives, God is there. And that was the experience of Moses as well. Many changes as we age. <laughs> there was a recent post on, on Facebook that I particularly enjoyed, the person wrote, it feels really strange to be the same age as old people. (laughs) Yeah, some of us can relate to that. We we, we don't think of ourselves in in those terms, but our security is in God. And and because our security is in Him, then we, we can allow ourselves to be flexible. We can allow ourselves to to not be resistant to all change just because it doesn't represent what we're familiar with and what we're comfortable with. We can trust God through it all. We need to be adaptable. Moses said, Lord, you're our dwelling place. And in the midst of constant change, the one thing that never changes is that God is there. These last six months have been difficult for so many, not only in our community, but in our country and in our world, in our world. And yet God is there. God hasn't been taken by surprise. Another aspect of wisdom that Moses shares in the midst of his prayer here is to recognize that life is short. It's wise to recognize that life is short so that we can make the most of our lives and we can live wisely. He says in verses 3 through 6, you turn men back to dust, saying return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that's just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new by evening. It's dry and withered. Verse 10, he says, the length of our days is 70 years or or 80 if we have the strength. I think he's providing perhaps a typical lifespan by way of example. He goes on to say, so teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Old fella in a community that I served before here used to say, Brother Sam, God didn't put us here to stay. God didn't put us here to stay. Life is brief. You know, Moses realized that. And he's telling us, reminding us our days are are numbered that we're mortal, that, and and we read it other places in the scriptures, that our lives are, are like a mist like a vapor. It's not quite that cool. It sure felt good this morning to feel cool air when I walked out. It reminds me of other days that I spent when it was far more cool than it is now where you could go out and you you breathe out and your air would be a visible mist and it was there. And then it would be gone. And that's a reminder of how our lives are. Because we recognize that we're mortal then we make the most of them. We don't have a guaranteed number of days. God knows those days, but we don't. So we invest ourselves wisely, however young or however old we may be. More wisdom from Moses. Moses warns that we need to avoid sin because it's serious. It makes life hard and it'll be judged. Verses 7 through 9, we're consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sin in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. And who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear 
that is due unto you. Moses recognizes before God that God is a righteous judge, that God is he who must deal justly with sin. And he explains here that while we may think that no one else notices our sin, none of it escapes God's notice. And it is due his judgment. It is serious. You know, I think many of us oftentimes think of sin most that we've broken a rule. We've broken a law. And that's true as far as it goes. But what is more significant to me is that when we sin, we break the heart of God who loves us and gave his son for us. We break the heart of one who desperately wants relationship with us. And when we sin, we, we sully up God's beautiful creation, mankind. We do harm to our lives and we do harm to others. Sin opens the door to heartache and negative consequences in our lives. Moses knew about that. One of the things that Moses wrestled with in his life was anger that seemed to get the best of him and, and, and created all sorts of heartache for him and, and created difficulty for, not only for him but for others. You know, when, when a parent loses a child to drug abuse or to the abuse of alcohol, when, when a parent loses a child to a drunk driver, it's understandable when they have very strong feelings about those, those things that led to the death of their child. Can you imagine as God looks upon His people, people whom He seeks relationship with, people that He, he desires to have fellowship with, people that He wants to be with Him forever. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that God feels very strongly about sin. It's completely contradictory to his nature. We, we know that. But imagine the heart of God the Father as he sees the result of sin in our lives. And, and so Moses here, in essence, tells us to avoid sin because of its consequences, because there's a holy God who must judge it. You know, as we get older... And hopefully we mature and hopefully develop greater humility. We become far more aware of our own sins. We, we, face, we face that matter with, with a greater sense of humility. And ideally, as, as we mature spiritually, our focus isn't so much upon the sin of others as an awareness of our own personal sin. And we, we, it develops a humility within us. Isaiah, as he experienced a vision of the Lord high and lifted up, his response was not about what was going on in the lives of other people. His response was, woe is me. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. We as people compare ourselves to other people and we feel pretty good. But as we grow in our faith, we compare ourselves to a holy God and we realize <laughs> amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, a wretch like me. The message of the Old Testament is that we have broken the law and the heart of God and we stand guilty. The message that comes to us in the New Testament is that God 
has sent his son to pay the complete penalty for our sin. And if I'm willing to repent and entrust myself to Jesus, then I can be forgiven. And that is grace. That is grace. Chip Ingram, pastor and author, wrote, What the holiness of God has demanded, the love of God has provided. And he has provided that in his son. The holiness of God demands judgment, but the love of God provided Jesus to atone for our sin. The judgment for our sin was upon him. Experiencing the love of God that satisfies and brings joy and never stops is also part of the wisdom that we see here from Moses. In verses 13 and 14, Moses spoke to the Lord and and later penned it says, Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. The unfailing love of God. Have you pondered that recently? Yeah. When I was a teenager, I remember... Uh, being in a camp service as somebody was speaking and they they shared these words that have been attributed to a a number of different authors. But But they said, and I took it personally, Sam, there's nothing that you can do that's going to make God love you any more than he already does. And there's nothing that you can do to make him love you any less than he already does. Rejoice in the love that God has for you. His love is unfailing. It is unceasing. It is as the song says, his love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on us. Finally, we see the wisdom for living the good life in Moses' prayer as he reminds us to stay focused on what's really important in the course of our lives. Verse 15. We've seen years of trouble. And he prays to God, Now give us as much joy as you gave us sorrow. Show your servants the wonderful things you do. Show your greatness to their children. Lord our God, treat us well. Give us success. Or as some translations render it, Lord, establish the works of our hands. So here's Moses in the last chapter of his life. We don't know exactly how old he was when he wrote this. But he's in that last chapter of his life. And he's praying that God would establish the work of his hands, that that God would be seen in his living, that God would make his life fruitful even in this chapter. I think we're often tempted to think that when we stop working our public jobs, when we retire, that it's it's time to retire from serving the Lord as well. I'm grateful that I live in a community where that's not the case, not, not across the board anyway. I'm grateful to be able to see people who now say, hey, I've got more time than I've ever had. Let me find a way to honor God in my living. Let, let me serve him however he sees fit. You know, this chapter of your life, if that's where you happen to be, could be the greatest opportunity for Christian service that you've had because you have more time. You have hopefully been able to accumulate a life of wisdom. And now with more time on your hands, you're able to devote yourself to making God known. Not only here locally, but in other places as well. I was, I was blessed in the first church that I pastored up in the state of Rhode Island to have a couple of men who had retired. One took an early retirement, the other was certainly of retirement age, and then some. 
who set a pace of ministry that I have admired through the years. And uh, it, it made me appreciate men who, who just devoted themselves to serving God. They didn't see all this extra time as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but rather as an opportunity for service. Now, I, I, certainly there's a place for us to enjoy ourselves and, and enjoy more time and hopefully be able to soon enjoy family and, and to uh, uh, invest ourselves in some things that bring some personal refreshment as well, of course. But I tell you, I, I, I don't think any of us wants to stand before the Lord and we'll all stand before him and, and be as we give account of our lives, I don't think our, our claim to fame needs to be, Lord, my, I got my golf score down the best it ever was in those years. Lord, my yard looked better than all my neighbor's yard. Well, the, you know, pretty yard's a good thing. Uh, I'm like anybody else who tries to chase a golf ball around the course. I'd rather have a lower score than a higher score. But I don't want that to be what I bring before the Lord and say, this is what I completely invested myself in in these latter years that you blessed me with. John wrote in the book of Revelation, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. Be faithful unto death. You see, our contributions matter at every stage in life. Let me offer just a couple of suggestions as I close this morning of how you can lead a life of significance no matter what stage of life that you're in. You know, one of, one of the things that we can do is so we can leave a legacy of faith and faithfulness in our living for those who will follow us. Some may find that they're in a position to financially invest in the future work of the Lord. And, and so they make those kinds of commitments. They, they so treasure the work of the Lord's church that they invest in that so that they're helped even, even after I'm gone and you're gone. Something that I uh, had suggested to me years ago was that, you know, when you put together your will and your heirs are going to, you know, uh, be exposed to that and, and probably welcome it with bated breath, my, I'm afraid mine are going to be somewhat disappointed. But one of the things that you can do is is write a letter that, describes your faith journey. Write a letter that describes just what the Lord meant to you and, and how you treasured him and have that be part of your paperwork that the next generation is going to be exposed to. And that makes a mark upon their life. Invest time when you can in your grandchildren. Take Take one of them out to lunch and just talk about how good the Lord has been to you and leave that legacy with them. Spend more time praying and less time worrying. Volunteer where you can volunteer. Find a way to make somebody's life better. When we get to the place where we can do this, invite somebody to come to church with you because... Uh, as we get older, they're a little more patient with us. And uh, perhaps they'll, they'll receive it better than they might have otherwise. But you, we can determine to set an inspirational example to others as we face the closing years and chapters of our lives. The good life is found ultimately in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He is the one who provides us security. The word of God is clear. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. Jesus declared, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When the disciples were asked, what, what can I do to be saved? Their simple and truthful declaration was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Make God your security. Remember that life is short. Remember that sin is serious and avoid it. Stay focused on those things that are really lasting and most important. Those things that will be honoring unto God. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for Moses. What a significant man he was. And I thank you for his prayer, his writing. Thank you, Lord, for the example that it leads for us, the insight that it, that it provides us, the wisdom that it provides us. Lord, may we find security in you in an ever-changing world. May we know what it is to experience your peace and to know hope as we face the future side by side with you. To this end, we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is Higher Ground. <laughs> Father, may your hand of blessing rest upon your people. We give you thanks for the opportunity, the privilege that it is ours, Lord, to hear the reading of your word, to lift our voices in praise and in song, Lord, to, to hear the expounding of your word. Thank you, O oh God, that come what may, that you are our eternal God. In you is our trust. May you be glorified and honored in our living. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.